he's the biggest single Bitcoin holder in, in the world, bigger than Satoshi. Because if he put 10 million in at $10, that's a million Bitcoin. The way that Zappo Bank actually started was because he orange pilled all these uh, millionaires and billionaires and they bought Bitcoin throughout 2012 and 2013. As Bitcoin ran up, they were like, oh, this like little bit of money that we've put into Bitcoin is now a lot of money, but we don't know how to store this safely. Can you take care of it for us? And Wences had come up with an offline storage solution for himself, for his Bitcoin, and ended up storing, you know, all his friends, Mike Novogratz, this person, that person. He orange built Reed Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, who then invested in Zappo Bank. Bill Miller, the famous value investor that loves Bitcoin. Wences orange pill. They were both on stage and Warren Buffett whipped out a t-shirt and gave it to Wences in front of everyone. And it said, Bitcoin is rat poison. And in 2019, Zappo sells that institutional custody business to Coinbase. And that's why Coinbase had the grayscale Bitcoin because it's actually, they bought Zappo's institutional custody business. So the reason why Coinbase has all these Bitcoin now and probably why they have all the most of majority of the ETFs go with them is because they bought Zappo's institutional custody business. I didn't tell this part of the story before, but his parents lost his life, their life savings three times in Argentina when he was growing up. was familiar with Bitcoin Gandalf before. And then I saw this post where you're both like, oh, not Bitcoin Gandalf anymore. It's now Daniel. Uh, and I loved it so much because this was uh, the same day I had a podcast around that topic. And he said like, oh, we Bitcoiners should be brave and we should be outgoing and we should not hide uh, in any circumstance. And I always say like, I respect anyone uh, who does not want to put his identity out there. I even had I have like, I think five or six podcasts where uh, the person is not with the name there, he's not with a camera, it's just a voice, uh, sometimes even like uh, uh, an edited voice. So uh, I still really like it when someone is brave and, and puts himself out there. Why did you take the step from being uh, anonymous, having a really big channel even? like I think it was like 70K or 80K you had on, on, on Twitter uh, and also newsletter uh, and now still being like, outspoken and being uh, Daniel? Uh, yeah, so the, my, I, I think it's, it's good to go back first to why I was anonymous in the first place, which I wasn't really, I wasn't really anonymous, but I just started this account uh, because I wanted to talk about Bitcoin. And uh, at the time, I didn't want to do it under my real name. Just for a, for a variety of reasons, I won't go into them now. But there was a there were reasons like I didn't want people to know that I was into Bitcoin at that time. Um, and also, as early days, I, I saw that uh, you know Bitcoin Twitter is there is a, a lot of shit posting going on. So I was like, oh, I can be a bit more liberal with some shit posting as well, uh, anonymously, right? You might do things not under your real name that you wouldn't do under your real name. But anyway, it was mainly just so I could uh, indulge in the obsession of Bitcoin. Uh, not under my real name. And then I never imagined that I would end up working in Bitcoin or that like a lot of people would follow me and be interested in what I had to say. I still sometimes can't, I don't understand why that is. But um, yeah, just one day as I started working in Bitcoin, I wasn't being anonymous in person. Like I wouldn't post photos of myself online, um, but you know, I would meet people and I would tell them who I was pretty much. If I knew they were in Bitcoin and on Twitter, I would tell them uh, who I was, especially because like, if I went up to someone and introduced myself as Daniel, they're like, yeah, whatever. But if I was like, oh, I'm Gandalf, they're like, oh, we've talked on Twitter or I follow you or there was like some more connection there. Right. So at the point I'm at now, I figured there's no point in having this like alter ego, uh, because I'm not being anonymous and it's kind of like difficult to have two personalities, like my real name and my real face. And then this, this alter ego, um, and I kind of want to reach out like now that I'm so I used to work at brains and marketing, but I left there at the end of last year to do my own thing. And I want to focus on sharing the Bitcoin story. Right. And I want to reach outside of the echo chamber, outside of the bubble. And I think I'll be more effective under using my real face and name than being some random wizard you know, an on person. I think people out, people inside of Bitcoin are very receptive to that. But outside of Bitcoin newbies, they might be put off by it. They might not take you seriously. You need a face to it. Like I, I saw it um, when I was not putting out videos and I was just putting Twitters out. I was, I, it was a really good contrast for me. Last year in Prague, 
nobody knew me. I was shit posting every day. I had a small account with like, I don't know, 7,000 followers or something like that, like that, that, and nobody knew me. And now I'm putting out a video every day uh, and I know knew so, so many people because then all of a sudden you have a face, you have a recognized, you see them when you, they're walking by and you have a such a uh, way better way to, to connect to people. I, I love it a lot when you, you put your face out there. It has its downsizes. Uh, you you have a little bit more risk on privacy. You have a little bit more risk on, on security. Uh, but I myself was like, ah, I want to do it. And I also put the... the uh, my decision on like, I want to be deep in the Bitcoin community and I want to put my face onto the Bitcoin community, um, a, a little bit earlier than you. And I'm not that far, uh, uh ahead in you, uh, like you, you, how long you're in, in Bitcoin and working in there? I uh, started, well, like I got, I became like, let's say orange pilled or obsessed and at the end of 2020. And I started working at brains in the middle of 2021, like July, 2021. So just over three years. So you really quickly, just over three years working. But you really quickly then became from like uh, orange build and I get Bitcoin to like I'm actually also working in Bitcoin. How was how did you this came together? Uh, yeah, so I I I used to have a business in real estate um, with a business partner, and I was in the process of exiting that business when I discovered Bitcoin. So it was, uh, it, was a, it was already like a pivotal moment in my like, professional career. I already knew I wanted to get out of doing real estate and do something else. I wanted to do something on the internet. Since like 2016, when I was like using social media to push my real estate business, I was like, okay, I want to do something in the, in the digital world, whether it's like media or software. Uh, that's, like what, that's where I want to go next. Um, because real estate is like a very physical thing. I have to be like present in the city. I have to go to a lot of physical appointments, right? So I wanted to do something that was that was scalable digitally. Uh, so it just happened. It just so happened that I came across Bitcoin at a time when I was in the process of exiting this business, uh, and then so I had nothing to do. And this, uh, I saw Brains post for a social media marketing intern, and I was like, well, I spend twelve hours a day on Twitter talking about Bitcoin, so might as well go and do it for Brains. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, you can you can get uh, paid for for shit posting on Twitter these days. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then they started sending me to conferences. Uh, you know, the role grew because I did start off as an intern, but like I'm thirty, I was like thirty three or thirty four years old, um, already with like a decade career in real estate, but was willing to start again from the bottom because I knew it was like, okay, I. I really enjoy Bitcoin. I would love to do this for the next like 10, 20, 30 years of my life. This takes a lot of uh, openness and a lot of like, because when you have a decade career, uh, especially if you, if you like it, I don't know if how much you like the real estate business, but if you kind of liked it and then you have a decade career and then you're like, oh, I want to be completely something new and, and real estate and Bitcoin is like, it's, it's similar, but there's a whole new group and a whole new community. Uh, it takes a lot of courage also to like uh, reinvent yourself uh, uh, with uh, over 30, I feel like. I, yeah, I, didn't feel like I, I didn't feel like I was being courageous. It just felt like I was pursuing my interests. So it wasn't like, I wasn't like scared or anything. And, and yeah. I, ha you know, I have faith that whatever, whatever you put your mind to, you can achieve, right? If it's a case like going into a new industry is a case of getting to know the people, uh, acquiring some knowledge and some skills. And that's with the internet, that's more, you know, you need time, right? I was fortunate that I had the time that I could invest into doing that. But, you know, with the internet these days, you can learn anything, you can meet anyone. So I wasn't necessary. I didn't feel courageous, although I, you know, I can see how that, you know, you can look at it that way. I've got, I, I we were in the process of also moving countries. So I grew, I lived most of my life in Hong Kong. I lived there for 25 years and it was around the same time as well that I was moving. My wife and I were moving to live in the UK and Scotland and I was about to have my first child as well. So it was just like a period of completely changing everything, you know, starting a family, moving to a different country and changing careers. Not, I don't recommend doing it all at the same time. The, the same thing, uh, oh shit, I forgot the name, CTO of Relay, uh, Adam. Yeah, Adam yeah. Bellican. 
Uh, yes, Adam Bennigan. He he also started relay uh, in I think the same month even when he got his first uh, f- first son. Uh, he, he also did the, he gave the same advice. Don't don't do it if you can. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I repeated the mistake because uh, we moved. I just moved to Dubai, and and also left brains at the same time to start doing my own thing. So I, I've done it twi- <laughs> twice now. <laughs> <laughs> maybe there's a third time Let, let's see <laughs> no more no more no more i'm Perfect. not moving then, yeah then today's topic uh you you suggested it in the beginning and I, I loved it a lot um i did not knew that that man but he seems really interesting and and uh, this is uh, i think when when i don't know him there's probably a lot of other people in the bitcoin community that are not aware, are not aware of him uh, that he orange built a lot of interesting people and, uh, and he has a really unique way of, of explaining people. Um, first off, uh, I, I already don't know again how to pronounce his name, uh, but it's, uh, the, the founder it's of the when, Sabo Bank. Yeah. It's Wences Casares. If you want to say it in Spanish, it's Wenceslao Casares is his whole name, but Wences is what, you know, people call her, how people pronounce it in English. It's very similar to Wednesday. In uh, German? No, no, no. The English word for Wednesday, like Wednesday. Oh, Wednesday. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, yeah. like, um, what what did he do, and and why is he interesting for you? And so, you're writing yeah, a so, book about him, right? Yeah. So, um, when so I'll give you a little bit of context of how I even got to that. So when I left Brains at the end of last year, I knew I wanted to double down. I, like the things that were going personally well for me in the Bitcoin space is obviously like Twitter. I felt like was an area to double down. And then in terms of media, the, you know, Twitter is a written medium. So I was like, I'm going to double down on writing on Twitter. Right. And just trying to find topics to write about. I realized I, 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 I challenged myself. I did this course and I was the, the part of the course was like, you had to write every day. Right. So every day I was like scrambling for something to think about, to write about on Twitter. And, uh, I started writing stories about things that have happened in Bitcoin or about people, basically events and people in Bitcoin's history, right? And these seem to get a lot of interest. Like people were really liking them. I was getting a lot of retweets, a lot of likes, a lot of good feedback. Um, And so my plan was like, well, okay, I'm going to write a book of short stories. Uh, Of course, I was going to make it, you know, 21 short stories. So I'm there looking for stories to, to put in this book. And I remember that in 2015, there was like, uh, it was all over the mainstream news that there was this Bitcoin's Fort Knox, right? There was these, there was some, some bank was storing hundreds of thousands of Bitcoins in Swiss military bunkers under the Swiss Alps. And so I, I was like, that's probably, there's probably a cool story behind there. So I started researching it. And that's when I uh, came across Wences. I'd already heard of Wences. And I remember that he was like the founder of Zappo Bank. But I didn't know how important he had been to, in the Bitcoin space back in the early days. So, um, so I, in researching for this short story book, I came across him. His life story is so incredible that I was like, okay, a, a book needs to be written about his life because it's insane, right? Uh, so I just went down a rabbit hole of, of researching every piece of content, every news article, just everything that exists in the world about him i've got like cataloged and and researched um but yeah he he was in so he grew up in i don't know if you know a place called patagonia in argentina it's like the bot it's like the bottom of argentina the very so the the southern part of argentina it's like barren winter desert so that but it's beautiful it's like mountains lakes but it gets super cold and it's very isolated he grew up on a sheep farm there so his parents are sheep ranchers. Um, his mom was entrepreneurial and his dad was actually like uh, obsessed with building his own radios and computers. So he got this like tech slash entrepreneurial streak from his parents. And when he went to university in 1994, he uh, tried the internet for the first time and ended up starting the first ever internet service provider in Argentina. Uh, and then anyway, yeah, he... He got rug pulled by his business partner, ended up with nothing and then started, but he saw the power of the internet. So he doubled down and he started Latin America's first uh, online brokerage 
in like 1996. And he sold that to Banco Santander for more than half and uh, more than $500 million in just before the dot com bubble. So he is, this is all before Bitcoin. So he is a, you know, entrepreneurial and rich before he discovers Bitcoin in 2011. So the, the reason how he came across Bitcoin was that uh, he goes on these like road trips. Him and his friends own this old school bus and they go on road trips around South America in it once a year. And this particular year, 2011, his friends, they, they needed to repair the bus. So he was living in, in San Francisco in Silicon Valley. And his friend calls him and says, hey, we need you to send us, you know, X amount, a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars for your share of the bus repairs. And at the time, Argentina had all these capital controls. So there was no PayPal. There's no Western Union. You can't do a bank transfer into the country. There was only like one, there was only one way to send money into the country is via the central bank. You had to fill out a bunch of paperwork, send the money to the central bank. They would convert it into the local currency at whatever exchange rate they felt like doing. And it, he was like, it's just too much hassle for the amount of money that I had to send. And then he said, one of his friends suggested that said he'd heard about this like internet money thing called Bitcoin and said, why don't you use that? You know, you can, it's, it allows you to send money anywhere in the world without anyone's permission. And Wentz as being a tech, a, a financial tech entrepreneur was like, you don't know anything about tech or finance. I know everything about tech and finance. I've never heard of this Bitcoin thing. So it must be like, he was immediately skeptical, right? His friend, like who knew nothing. So, but anyway, but he looks into it. Uh, so he starts doing some research about Bitcoin and he finds a guy on Craigslist that's willing to sell him $2,000 worth of Bitcoin in person, peer to peer, right? And this is when Bitcoin is like $3 or something. So they arranged to meet at a cafe in Palo Alto in, in uh, California, San Francisco. Um, and he walks in there and he said the guy is like an old, like old 50 year old guy with like a white beard and long white hair. And he says he looks like Gandalf. Yeah. And uh, so uh, Gandalf gets him to download a, a, you know, a Bitcoin wallet. He scans a QR code. You know, Wences gives him the gives him two thousand dollars and the guy says, OK, I've sent you the Bitcoin. And Wences leaves the coffee shop convinced that he's been scammed out of two thousand dollars. But he does what his friend said and sends the Bitcoin over to his friend in Argentina. And a few hours later, his friend calls him and says, hey, Wences, I've got the money your part is all settled for the bus repairs. And Wen says, is like, what the hell just happened? Yeah, so he's like shocked. So he starts researching Bitcoin, going down the proverbial rabbit hole. He even hires a team of hackers. He, he pays a team of hackers $250,000 to spend three months trying to break Bitcoin, find bugs, hack a wallet, et cetera, et cetera. And the team of hackers comes back to him. But in the meantime, also, he's like flying around the US meeting with anyone that he knows that knows about Bitcoin to try and learn. He's reading everything he can about Bitcoin. But, you know, 2011 is probably like Bitcoin talk forums. And, you know, maybe he met a few of the early OGs that were uh, in Bitcoin back then. Um, but, yeah, this team of hackers, after three months, they come back to Wences and say, uh, we haven't been able to break Bitcoin but we'd love to keep trying for another few months because we think maybe we can, we can do something, but we just need more time. Uh, and then so they're like, Wes is like, okay, how much time do you need? And they're like, oh, we want another three months. And then and they're like, and we want another $150,000, but we want to get paid in Bitcoin. And that's when he's like, okay, you know, shuts it all. He's like, by this time, he's convinced, okay, there's something here. And in 2012, he is putting tens of millions of dollars into Bitcoin. This is when Bit like Bitcoin in 2012 is traded between like seven and $13. So I, yeah, I've seen this mentioned on Twitter. Some people think that he's the biggest single Bitcoin holder in, in the world, bigger than Satoshi, because if he put 10 million in at $10, that's a million Bitcoin. Right. And, and this is the part of his story is in a book called Digital Gold. I'm not sure if you've ever read it, but it's very good. It's, it's about like, yeah, it's a story from the beginning of Bitcoin to about 2013. And Wences is in a character in that book a lot. Uh, and that's where it says that he's throughout 2012, he puts up to 10% of his net worth, tens of millions of dollars into Bitcoin. And so 
if you just go conservative, if you if you take the middle price of 2012, which is around ten dollars, and you go conservative and just say he bought ten million dollars worth, that's a million Bitcoin, and he's likely that he bought more than that, so he probably has more than a million. I've seen videos of him in 2021 saying he is buying more. So imagine somebody who bought Bitcoin at three dollars buying more at forty five thousand dollars or whatever fifth whatever it was back then, and it was like April 2021. So maybe it was like 45K and he's still buying more. That's an amazing but, uh, story already. Yeah. I mean, he, so because he was a successful uh, sort of early internet entrepreneur, he had, he had a lot of VC investors in his company that he sold for $500 million. So, and he had other, he did other business, other, other startups as well. Like he did an online bank in Brazil in the early 2000s. He did one of the first apps that allowed you to like put your cards on a mobile wallet and pay with them, like your, you know, your regular debit and credit card. So he was very well connected in Silicon Valley, Wall Street with like hedge fund managers and VCs. And so when he got obsessed with Bitcoin, of course, he was going around telling everyone about Bitcoin and he got them all into it as well. And the way that Zappo Bank actually started was uh, because he orange pilled all these uh, millionaires and billionaires, and they bought Bitcoin throughout 2012 and 2013. As Bitcoin ran up, they were like, "Oh, this like little bit of money that we've put into Bitcoin is now a lot of money, but we don't know how to store this safely. Can you take care of it for us?" And Wences had come up with an offline storage solution for himself for his Bitcoin. And ended up storing, you know, all his friends, Mike Novogratz, this person, that person. He orange pilled Reed Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, who then invested in Zappo Bank. Bill Miller, the famous value investor that loves Bitcoin. Wences orange pilled him. He even orange pilled Bill Gates, although Bill Gates later changed his mind about Bitcoin because of Warren Buffett. But Wences, Wences has even met, I wrote a story in my newsletter uh, about the time when Wences met Warren Buffett to teach him about Bitcoin. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> the, the, it didn't go the, the, well. It didn't go well. Uh, he, t he says, you know, Warren Buffett just believes in, you know, productive assets. Uh, so yeah, he doesn't understand. He doesn't, he doesn't get the, the, he thinks like gold is just like a pet rock that does nothing. He doesn't, I guess he doesn't get the like whole money side of it. Uh, he just looks at it as like, is this making me cash flow? And is this like contributing to society in some way? Uh, which is fair enough. I mean, look at, yeah, just War Warren Buffett is goes for what's worked for him, which makes perfect sense. But he says that at a, um, at a conference, they were both on stage and Warren Buffett whipped out a t-shirt and gave it to Wences in front of everyone. And it said, Bitcoin is rat poisoned. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, nice. But yeah, so anyway, storing all these Bitcoin, he's like, okay, there's some, there's obviously demand for, you know, Bitcoin custody. So he starts Zappo Bank and Zappo, the, Zappo Bank ends up being the largest custodian of Bitcoin in the world. They custody the grayscale Bitcoin fund. They custody uh, Bitcoin from like Canadian and European funds as well that existed before the ETFs. And in 2019, Zappo sells that institutional custody business to Coinbase. And that's why Coinbase had the grayscale Bitcoin because it's actually they bought Zappos institutional custody business. So the reason why Coinbase has all these Bitcoin now and probably why they have all the e most of, majority of the ETFs go with them is because they bought Zappos institutional custody business. It's an amazing origin story. I like I have every day Bitcoin on and I never heard that. <laughs> yeah, I mean he's he's it, He's insane. You can, if you YouTube his name, he has, he's got, a, he's been on a few podcasts and he's got a lot of stories. He tells, he has a, he has a talk that people like, which is sort of explains what money is and then goes through to why Bitcoin is the best form. It's like the bullish case for Bitcoin before the bullish case for Bitcoin kind of thing. Mm. And you yeah. also said uh, that he has a unique way of explaining uh, Bitcoin. And I think you, you want to write even two books about him. The first is like how he explains Bitcoin and, and the other one is was the, the biography about him. Yeah, the, the, so the one, the one where, so I want to frame the, I thought about how I got into Bitcoin, right? And how, what made me pay attention to it. And for me, it was, 
someone that I looked up to, admired and respected told me about Bitcoin. Before that, when I heard about it, I just completely dismissed it. But once somebody that I, that I respected told me about it, that I thought, oh, this guy is smart. If he's saying that I should look at it, then there must be something there for me to look at. And so I want to frame the sort of selling or explaining Bitcoin from like using his credibility because he's had such an incredible career. He's obviously very smart and he's obviously able to explain it in it. But so what's, it's maybe not so unique now, but it's the fact that he framed it as like why it's good money, right? And he was also able, I guess back then it just wasn't as, as now there's so much Bitcoin content and we all know the, the narratives and why it's valuable and all that stuff. But back then, the way he was explaining it was revolutionary. Nobody, very few people could understand it that way. So the fact that it was like complete, that nobody controlled it, right? There was, he, he called it sovereign, he called it like sovereign money, sovereign as in like, it was your, you, nobody else could control it. Only you, nobody else could stop you from sending money anywhere in the world. He was also heavily driven. I didn't tell this part of the story before, but his parents lost his li their life savings three times in Argentina when he was growing up. So he also felt at first that the internet would give greater access to financial assets and services for uh, poorer people so that they wouldn't have to be exposed, you know, they wouldn't be exposed to, I guess, like if you own some real estate, you're sort of protected by hyperinflation. Or if you own some assets, you're protected from from hyperinflation. Uh, but his parents didn't have that. And then he became disillusioned with the internet thinking it's actually not doing what I thought it would do uh, for financial inclusivity. And then when he discovered Bitcoin, his hope for that was renewed because he's like, oh, maybe this is the thing that that can help people like my parents protect their wealth, which is true. But we're still so early that people don't don't understand it. Most mm. people. Yeah, it's definitely it's it's, it's like when we uh, go in the in the outside of our Bitcoin bubble, <laughs> outside of our uh, small little comfortable uh, conferences, we were in Bitcoin Prague and all this. Uh, then it's like, oh yeah, people don't understand what money is. People don't understand what Bitcoin is, and you really have to explain this. Like we really have to educate people. Yeah, I mean, I don't blame them. Uh, I didn't know what money. I did my degree. My university degree was economics of money, banking, and finance, and I did not. They did not explain what money was to me. I did my uh, my university dissertation uh, on silver, but I did it on silver as an industrial metal, you know, also as money. But the thesis was saying that, like, as more as as the as the world shifts to more towards more like electronics and technology, those things all require silver in them. And that's why silver price is going to pump, not because of its monetary value, but because of its industrial demand use. And this was in 2011. I, I looked back through it the other day to see if I've mentioned Bitcoin in it, but I didn't. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistics. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order plus you support my channel. And now let's get back to the video. It's interesting. Uh, do you think that it's important for us to be uh, uh, out there and, and talking about Bitcoin? Uh, because sometimes I have the feeling oh, Bitcoin does, does what it does anyways. It, it doesn't need me. Uh, and I can just like shut up about it. But then I see all those people in, in, in my environment and I really want to educate. I, I, I want to uh, be there for them. And I want to be that 
uh, person that they can call at like 11 p.m. and say like, oh, can you explain me Bitcoin? And I will be sitting there with them till 4 a.m. so they understand that if they're willing to learn it. So uh, some of the things are like, why do we have those massive drive in us um, to, to explain and educate other people about Bitcoin, even though we don't really need it? Because um, when we are honest with us, uh, if, if, if I'm not around anymore, Bitcoin does not change it. Like, not, not, not even like a Michael Cena, not even the really big uh, people. They, they might be, might be interesting uh, what happens then. But even like, even uh, Elon Musk did not have a, a huge impact uh, after his first impact. Uh, like, he had this major impact before when he bought and then he uh, said shit about it. But afterwards, he did not even have uh, an impact in, on the network and he's the richest dude. Uh, uh, right now on earth so i feel like we, we don't have a really an impact in bitcoin but at the same time um we really want to have an impact we really want to contribute to, to bitcoin uh do, do we need to uh, i guess my question is like do we need to be there uh, in, in bitcoin or is it something that is just naturally coming no i think bitcoin is nothing without the social layer right bitcoin needs people to use it to for it to be worth something and for it to be useful if it just sits there, no one runs a node, no one uses Bitcoin, no one talks about Bitcoin. It's just some code on a computer, right? So it definitely, Bitcoin needs the people. Uh, but yeah, you could argue, is there any one person or small group of people that are that important to Bitcoin to the point where like, if they're not involved in it or not talking about it, that Bitcoin goes away? I don't think so. We've gone, I think we've gone past that point where uh any one person or entity has a massive, massive amount of influence over the Bitcoin, as in like Bitcoin, the network. But I mean, you know, if Sailor turned around tomorrow and said, I'm selling all my Bitcoin, that would definitely have an impact on the market, on the price, right? So there, there are concentrations of influence to some aspects of Bitcoin, like the price, if Michael Saylor was to sell, right? If a lot of people are are in it because Sailor sold them on it and but they're not that convinced themselves and then Sailor sells those people are probably also going to sell if they're just following someone right um at, when it comes to like why do we want to teach other people about bitcoin i i don't know i mean i'll speak personally i just i i like bitcoin so i like talking about it not necessarily teaching, but of course, when somebody shows an interest in something that you're interested in, especially if they don't know, the conversation just goes towards that. You know, you have to explain how it works to someone before you can sort of have a conversation with them about it. Uh, I'm not like outwardly, I don't go around thinking I'm going to teach all these people about Bitcoin. It's more about like, uh, it's, it's more about the, th the fact that I do it because I enjoy it. And I just put it out into the world. And if other people get some use out of it, then fantastic. But I'm not constantly thinking about like, how can I do a better job to educate other people? Or like, how can I, you know, how can I reach more people? I mean, yes, I do think about how I can reach more people actually, but it comes from like, I do it because I enjoy it rather than like the extrinsic, I want to teach people Bitcoin. Yeah, sometimes I feel like um, uh, outside of Bitcoin, when we look at the crypto space, they even do sometimes a really good job in marketing their tokens, their their projects. Uh, uh, and in Bitcoin, because we don't have like this organized thing, everyone does his own thing. Of course, they're like uh, some some decentralized organizations where they're like, oh yeah, we we want to promote Bitcoin, we want to promote here, uh, but there's no like real. Um, like there's no one in Bitcoin that, that holds all the strings and like says, oh, on all, all the podcasts we're talking about this now, this is the beauty of it. Uh, but sometimes yeah, yeah. I, feel, I feel like this also um, the, makes the whole process a little bit uh, slower of the adoption. Yeah, I mean, we don't have like, if you think about the pillars of des like human desire, it's like health, wealth, relationships maybe. So like, you know, crypto tokens, they're selling you on wealth buy my token, get rich tomorrow, or, you know, it's going it, to, they're always trying to sell the Bitcoin story, right? Bitcoin did so well. And in some years, very well, very quickly, you know, you bought Bitcoin at $3 in 2011, and it was $1,200 or $1,300 two years later, right? Uh, that return is insane. I think all 
uh, cryptocurrencies are piggybacking off that performance and that success and trying to sell you that they're going to be the next one to do that. They're the next big thing. But there is no next big thing, right? Bitcoin is the next big thing. Did you uh, venture into uh, altcoins uh, at some point? Very, very briefly. When I like, so when I got into Bitcoin, I was lucky that like I understood that you don't un like. It's very hard to unseat the top dog. It's like I'm not going to launch another mobile phone company and com and say I'm going to come in here. I'm going to be the next Apple, right? What do I think is more likely that Apple sells more iPhones 10 years from now than they do today or that somebody else is going to come in and be the next Apple? I would bet that Apple in 10 years is still the t number one, right? Especially because like the network that what we don't understand with uh, or what I don't think gets talked about enough with these, let's call them like a crypto protocol, right? Because this is a, sort of what Bitcoin is. It, it is a protocol at the end of the day is that they benefit from massive network to network effects, right? So you can, even though it appears that it's, uh, that it's very difficult to make a better Bitcoin without trading off some aspects of Bitcoin that make it what it is. Like, it's almost like Bitcoin has like perfected, it's got like the perfect balance of like decentralization and block time and block size and all that stuff, right? So if you change any of those things, you're messing with other things you're sacrificing like for example we all know from the block size wars increase the block size potentially you're increasing the cost of running a node and so you decrease decentralization but the point is that these things are networks right and even if somebody could come up with a better bitcoin like somebody could come up with a more feature rich facebook but good luck getting everyone to go off facebook onto your network right i think it's the same with bitcoin If somebody was able to come up with something that's technically better than Bitcoin, it's still extremely difficult to undo the network effects that Bitcoin has. And so that's how I look at that. So going back to the other tokens, I, or I kind of already understood that when I got into Bitcoin. And so it was like, Bitcoin is the thing. The rest of them are like, it's like gambling, right? The rest of them, like, yeah, maybe you buy like 10 shit coins and maybe one of them goes up a thousand X or whatever. But what I found was that owning a few shit coins, I was just like constantly checking the price of them all the time. And I didn't, I didn't know what they did. I didn't know how they worked. I didn't understand anything about them. So at some point I was like, let me just concentrate on the one thing that I do kind of understand uh, and not bother with the rest of it. I'm, I'm gonna like, uh, I'm gonna like put all your eggs in the basket that you understand. <laughs> yeah, I think this, this all in the uh, one basket uh, analogy is also really interesting because for me, diversification is, um, you want, you don't want to have centralized risks. For example, why it makes sense for you to be diversified when you have a stock portfolio, because do you don't want to be dependent on one management team? Uh, it would be crazy to put all your financial energy in one company. Even if it's, if it's a really good company, they can still go out of business, even if they are doing really, really good. Even Apple can go out of business in some, some, at some day. There is like a low probability, uh, in like the next five to 10 years. Uh, but even in the next five to 10 years, there can something major happen. And I don't, uh, I never want to have this when I think about stock investing. Because I don't want to have centralized risk. There can be something happening to the management team. Uh, that's why it makes sense when you look at stocks to diversify above like five, 10, 15 stocks. But with Bitcoin, there is no uh, management team. There's no internal risk. Of course, there are like things that you have to look carefully at and then you have to uh, see uh, yourself w what you do with uh, those things because if you have your bitcoin on exchange then you have a risk there you should not do that you should hold your own keys or diversify like have some on exchange have some on your self-custody have maybe different custody solutions have maybe multi-signature there's a lot of lot to it uh but i feel like the, the diversification is uh it, it gets thrown around a lot when, oh you're all in the bitcoin oh, you're not diversified ah, okay yeah but uh, what, what risk is is there I mean, it's like you, if you have a, if you work for, if you have a job, right, you're all in 
on that job. If you get fired tomorrow, you lose your income. So you're not diversified from an income perspective, right? And that's how most people survive financially is paycheck to paycheck. But then when they're putting their like $150 a month away into their, you know, stock investment thing, they're like, no, I must be fully diversified. Let, you know, lest I lose my nest egg of $5,000. So, you know, I, yeah, I, I'm a big believer in like, you're, you're not going to, <coughs> excuse me, you're not going to, you're not going to outperform by just following the market by definition, right? You're not going to outperform the market by just, so you have to take concentrated bets on things that you have a high degree of certainty that are going to work out. Right. And if you do that enough times over your life, sure. Some, you will be wrong and you will lose, but you just need to be right more than you're wrong to come out on top. Right. Look at like every single ultra rich person in the world has become ultra rich because they've gone in on one thing like Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway stock, Bill Gates, Microsoft. Like so every rich person has become at least initially rich because they went big and, you know, s- some bet of theirs w- made it and won and gave them outsized returns. Nobody's ever gotten rich from, well, okay, Maybe if you invest in S&P 500, you know, if you, if you make a few hundred thousand dollars salary and you spend less than you make and you put it in an S&P 500 index fund, maybe after 40 years, you have like a nice nest egg, right? But you haven't outperformed. You've just gone with the market. Look at Bill. I mean, Bill Miller that we were mentioning him before that when says Orange built him, he was like 80% of his portfolio was in Amazon and Bitcoin. Right. And he's like, yeah, I made a killing. He owned 15% of Amazon at one point, 15% of Amazon. So. Yeah. And even, uh, people point this always out with diversification. When we talk about Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway, uh, even they are quite, uh, concentrated with like Coca-Cola stock and Apple stock. And even he, and I, I think Charlie Mango also said, uh, the diversification, um, is an insurance against ignorance as some, yeah. some, some quote around that. So even like, uh, he will, he was stocks and he was like, you have, you have to concentrate on one thing. And even he had, uh, uh, multiple things. It's interesting to see. But the one thing that I wanted to ask you before, uh, with the, with the Bitcoin, how important, uh, do you think is the origin story of, of Bitcoin that we don't know who Satoshi Nakamoto is, uh, the mystery around that, uh, how different would uh, maybe also Bitcoin be if there actually would be a head, like, I don't know, like an, uh, someone that we actually know and who's visiting Bitcoin conferences. Yeah, I think, well, it's two different things, right? To have a, to have a head that's known and still around and influential and to have a head that was there at the beginning, but has now disappeared uh, are like two different things to look at. So I think the fact that no one knows who created Bitcoin, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. As long as like, I think if we knew who created it, but that person died or wasn't around anymore or whatever, maybe it wouldn't be a big deal anyway now, right? Maybe some people are put off but from Bitcoin because they're like, what? No one knows who made it. You know, that seems like weird. And, you know, I want to, I want to know that somebody that I can trust or somebody that's reputable that made it, even if they're not around now. I think if we had a figurehead now, that would be bad, right? Because it's just another point of centralization. Even if it's just like on the social layer of it, let's just say he has no direct influence. He, you know, there is no like, Satoshi can't go in there and change the code and suddenly Bitcoin is whatever he wants it to be and we all are forced to use it that way, right? Uh, But it would be bad to have somebody who was like a Vitalik figure because whether you like it or not, people are going to look to him for him to to know what to do or what to think or whether something is good or bad. And it's nice that we don't have that at all. Whether it's a good thing that we don't know who created it I don't know. Maybe it would have been cool if it was like someone awesome that passed away that everyone is like, this guy's awesome. He created Bitcoin. It helps bring more people to it because it was like a figure that people like. 
Yeah, it would be interesting. Uh, I mean, uh, there are even uh, um, stories about Steve Jobs being Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, a similar time, but uh, like, uh, it, it, uh, there's no real substance to it. Just it would be a story that I would really like to be true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If like, that's what I mean, if it was like some legendary figure that brought people. Yeah, that made people like Bitcoin more because of who that person was. Then I think that would be a good thing. As long as they're not around anymore. Yep, but even if it, uh, even if um, the figure is not around anymore, I mean, we, we see it with Vit Vitalik. He's around uh, right now, and obviously, it's really bad uh, because I see it all the time. Uh, I think even I engaged in that and and, and contribute to that, uh, and I'm not proud of that. I did this last year. Uh, I try to not do it anymore right now. But people put Vitalik there. And say like, oh, you trust uh, uh, this Ethereum thing, and and the founder and and, and like kind of the the CEO of it uh, looks like that and does that, uh, and that should I think that should not be be the argument, even though it's an interesting and, and a funny one, and it's engaging one, and it has the community aspect to it, uh, and I engaged a lot in in that last year. Tried to not do it right now, um, but uh, it's it's I think as, as when you have someone to attack. It becomes more about the figure and less about the technology and, and the fundamentals. And that's what I really like about that. We don't even know anything really about Satoshi Nakamoto. I mean, we know some things of, about the emails and stuff like that, but uh, nothing really substantial. Uh, so uh, we have nothing to even attack. It's like an, a thing that we ca cannot contribute anything to. Yeah, I mean, even then though, you essentially the block size wars were in part saying this is the original vision for bitcoin that satoshi had right based on what the white paper said um versus people who are saying no that's not it it's more the digital gold thing you know they're saying it's peer-to-peer -peer. it was the peer-to-peer -peer cash right electronic cash versus the uh store of value digital gold narrative i guess is how you could one of the ways that you could you could frame it um, and that's just from like a nine page thing that Satoshi wrote at the beginning. And we, and it caused the civil part of that caused the civil war, right? Arguing about what Satoshi's vision for Bitcoin would have been or was back then. Um, so even with like being anonymous, only being around for a little bit, it still leaves a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's still, it's still, it's still as what they left what Satoshi left is still like uh, influences what people think today and how people think Bitcoin should be. So yeah, imagine with someone I do. Yeah. I, I get the whole joke like, Oh, Vitalik runs with Ethereum. Like that's, it's, it's a trope, right? We're making, we're poking fun. It's like tribalism. It's like, it's like a, if you follow football and you're like a Barcelona fan and a Real Madrid fan, you just rip into each other. That's just like part of the, the, the fun of being on different tribes and different teams. Um, you know, but yeah, it, it's nice. It's nice that Bitcoin grew organically as a piece of open source software that one person, you know, we think one person worked on and just released onto the internet. Um, whereas like Ethereum was orchestrated and organized, you know, there was an organization of humans behind creating Ethereum. Sure, maybe now it's decentralized enough that no one person can control it or not. I don't really follow the like sort of governance of Ethereum that closely anymore. I used to be like you, like, you know, before I would engage in a lot of like Ethereum trolling and, you know, dunking on it on shit coins and stuff like that. And I try to do it less and less these days because uh, it's just not that productive. But I'd rather focus on, you know, on Bitcoin, what I can do for Bitcoin, what Bitcoin can do for me. And, uh, living my life rather than, rather than doing a lot of dunking on the internet on other people. Um, but yeah, it, 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 the way Bitcoin was created is virtually impossible to recreate. And that's a thing that's uh, even beyond the network effect. Uh, that's something so beautiful. It's like if, if Bitcoin actually is what we all think it is, um, and it will be this global money and it will be really successful. This origin story 
is such a nice one. And there are already so many books about who Satoshi might be and all those things like they're interpreting the emails, what accent it could be, <laughs> like where yeah, it could be like, I even like, I know in the beginning, I was also really fascinated with the story and I got to know, um, I forgot who said it to me. It was some podcast uh, that I did with someone. He said like his girlfriend uh, was not interested in Bitcoin. But once she heard about the story of Satoshi Nakamoto, she all of a sudden got really interested in Bitcoin she, because she researched so much about him because she found that origin story so interesting. So I think there's some some beauty to to that uh, and it makes part of the, the value of Bitcoin. It could have been also successful if we actually know him. Uh, would have maybe been different, but uh, it's 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 a really... It's also like the spirit of Satoshi where you contribute something to society uh, and you don't get the credit for it. That's why I also decided on the podcast because some people are like, oh, can I take the video? Can I take that? And I'm like, yes. Like I also made like the YouTube switch from, uh, I don't know how they're called. Like now it's open to anyone uh, and everyone can just like take the video uh, and do whatever they want with it. Like I'm totally fine with that. I said it multiple times on the podcast. Uh, and even if you don't, if you want to do something commercial uh, with, with me, uh, to, I hit me up. I will give you the raw footage. I don't care. Uh, you spread Bitcoin. You spread my podcast. It's 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 fine with me. Uh, so I think that's the true spirit of Satoshi. Like just like contributing to society and and not necessarily taking the credit, even though it's important that you also. Um, make something out of that so you can live off that. So like you, you can contribute more on, on that. But yeah, that I, I like that uh, Satoshi spirit a lot. And uh, I, I love that Bitcoin has this, this origin story. Yeah, it's cool. It, it, it's kind of like being, you know, the people who are anonymous on Twitter and stuff, they're kind of like taking on this ethos of Satoshi, which is like, you know, you don't want to be known. Uh, and there is a there is something about human nature that uh likes this sort of mystery like i think i've i've felt it with gandalf as well where people like when they meet me if they already know who i am it's kind of like whatever but if they're meeting like gandalf they don't you know who's like not public and nobody really knows who he is that's a lot cooler for some reason um and i think it's the same with like it's the same with satoshi it's a lot cooler to have this like mystery behind the origin story of bitcoin which is like nobody knows who made it who was satoshi and what you know all these things whereas like ethereum it's metallic you know we know what he looks like we know he's like i think it's it's like it's like uh, reading a book versus watching a movie right in a book you make up you know, you make up the characters in your head. Obviously, they're described, but everyone has like a slightly different image of a character in their head. But then you watch the movie and it's like, that's not how I imagined him at all, right? So with Satoshi, we can all kind of imagine, we don't know who he or she is. And so we all have to just like imagine this person. And since he made something that we all think is, is cool, you know, it's very likely that we're like making him out to be this awesome character in our head. Perhaps if we actually met found out who satoshi really was and met him would be like oh you know not not that cool <laughs> the image would be destroyed um yeah. coming closer to the to the end of the podcast i have a question that i only asked once in the podcast uh, but the answer was so interesting so i thought like yeah let's ask it uh, more times um what annoys you the most uh, in the bitcoin community oh man just one thing you can do as much things as you want. Uh, I, I mean, I don't, I don't like the, I, I don't like some of the preachiness that's around. You know, people like. I think the ethos of Bitcoin is very libertarian, but you get a lot of people who are like constantly telling you how you should live your life, what you should eat, what you should do, what's moral, what's not moral, what's right, what's wrong. Um, I don't know if it's, you know, to be fair, when you meet people in real life, that's not what they're like at all. Uh, but you, I guess it's just like the odd Twitter person screeching that comes up on the timeline and gives you this impression that there is a lot of, a lot of preachiness. So it's, yeah, it's almost like, you know, people who are like LARPing as libertarians are actually secretly like uh, dictators. And I, I don't like, there is this also feeling because Bitcoin is free and open source that like everything anyone does should be free and like, you know, 
free and open source. And if somebody makes like put something for sale or tries to make some money out of their work, it's like, oh, what are you doing? Why isn't it free and open source? So uh, I don't like that either. Um, but yeah, I mean, generally, I would say it's nothing about Bitcoin itself. It's from it's the social layer of of things. But I guess that's just like a human thing. And it would happen in any other industry or, uh, you know, around any other area of interest, not just Bitcoin. But that's just, just what comes to mind with Bitcoin. There's this uh, great meme uh, where there are two bo dogs really loudly barking at, it, at each other and there's like a fence in between. And then the fence goes up and then they're like really nice to each other. They're not doing uh, anything. So it's, it's like when, when they're fenced there and they're, when you're on Twitter, like, Arr! but um, when you're actually going in real life, and that's why I'm saying to everyone, go on to the real life and meet Bitcoiners, go to a local meetup, go to conference, go to whatever, like, like go, there's orange pill up there. There's so many possibilities that you can actually meet um, real life Bitcoiners and the, uh, Uh, the experience is so much different than on Twitter and all those places because they are actually nice people that are completely normal. They are not barking at each other and they're not saying, oh, you have to eat meat and you have to do this. <laughs> like, yeah. They're, they're just I mean, nice people. These things could be also just, a, you know, in, it could be a, a, as a result of just being on the internet where, you know, Twitter is not exactly a place for nuance discussion or communication. So, uh, It could also just be that. Yeah, because like, like you said, go, I would definitely recommend, you know, if somebody wants to like sort of make it in the Bitcoin space, as in they want to be more involved in the Bitcoin space, I would say get on Twitter, share your thoughts, interact with people there, and then go to conferences in person and meet the people that you talk to on Twitter in real life, uh, and you will be in the Bitcoin space then. You, uh, get, getting physical, getting actually uh, in real life, meeting people in the Bitcoin community, it's so necessary. Even if like uh, for every, anyone that wants to have a career or anything like that, that you just said it like you have to do this anyways. Like it's, uh, it's, it's almost uh, uh, necessary. It's, it's like you can do it without, but uh, it's almost necessary. Uh, but even if you don't want to uh, have like a career in Bitcoin, even if you're just interested in Bitcoin or you have a lot of Bitcoin and you, and you just want to explore what the community and everything is about, you get so many insights. I loved it. I could, could not, I did not have enough time this year, but last year I went to every booth there was and I spoke with every company. This was such a nice overview and insights in the what's, what's right now. And then you go to a conference and you're like, oh shit, this Bitcoin thing is an actual industry it's yeah. not just like some weird uh, token on the internet that you bought and it goes up and bitcoin is an actual industry where actual real life people actually work <laughs> yeah there's businesses i mean there's you know there's businesses that have been around for 10 years that employ hundreds of people uh who you know their entire careers are based on 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 the bitcoin industry so yeah completely agree the the going to conferences in person is a game changer Definitely, definitely. Perfect. Then uh, before we get to the end routine, I have one more question that I ask all my guests now. Uh, to the, the, the goal of that question is to learn from each other outside of Bitcoin. Um, mm -hmm. And the question is, what are you currently passionate about besides Bitcoin? What are you currently learning about doing activity, passionate about, uh, and no matter what it is, uh, besides Bitcoin? Storytelling. That's what I'm focusing on right now. I mean, it, it, it's because of Bitcoin. It's because I'm trying to find better ways to communicate the value proposition of Bitcoin uh, that I stumbled on, like on on storytelling. So that's what I've been studying: is like, what is a good story? What is the structure of a good story? What are the elements of a good story? Uh, so that's, that's yeah. a really important step. And we have an entertain in the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who actually the next guest uh, is. And the question today is really interesting. Um, what world do you want to create uh, for your children and how different will it be for them compared to you? That's a deep question, isn't it? Uh, it's good. Uh, it, it would be a long one. <laughs> I mean, I'll try to relate it to Bitcoin a little bit just to keep it on topic. But I think... If we can live in a world where money is not controlled by any one 
entity, person, state, government, or whatever, that will be a fairer world. You know, unfortunately, human nature is such that we're corrupted. We're almost corrupted by the power that having control over money brings. <clears throat> and so we can't help but use that power to benefit ourselves and usually at the, at, you know, at the cost of other people. So having a money that, we can't con that no one can control I think just makes things, makes society a little bit fairer, a little bit more meritocratic. Um, so that would be, I, I would hope my children can grow up in a world with fairer money. How different would that be? Like, uh, what do you imagine the, the world outside of the money being fair? Uh, would, what would that change for society? Well, I mean, maybe in countries where, money tends to work relatively well the impact wouldn't be massive but i think for a lot of countries where their money is you know worthless it would be everything you know people can people can spend mental energy on actually doing some productive stuff with their lives rather than worrying about you know they have to get on a bus to go get cash out or they you know the government prints a bajillion Zimbabwean dollars and all their savings are now worthless and they have to start again from scratch. I think we lost, we lose a lot of human potential by having broken money. And we fix that by having good money again. I love it a lot. Yeah. Um, great. Then before uh, I let you go, where can people find you and ask you questions? So Twitter is the best place. I'm at BTC Gandalf and everything flows from twitter perfect w will you change the the, the handle at, at some point or is will it no, always I think I'm, gonna keep, i'm gonna I, i'm gonna keep it i'm gonna keep it. it's a nice like little relic and memory of the past and i don't think anyone really looks at it so it, w it would be more confusing if people are trying to find me and i've changed i've also changed the handle i think people will always remember that btc gandalf thing so they can always find me that way if they don't remember what my real name is or whatever perfect Really good. Cool. Yeah. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, thank you for being on and thank you for taking the time today. And yeah, for everyone watching and listening, thank you for being here and I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me, mate.